All right, uh, so let's start. And uh, these are a couple of remarks. All right. Um, this remark, I leave it to you. Uh, please uh, read and solve. Uh, end of the lecture. You are yes. not at every screen, sir. I'm not sharing screen. That's bad. That's bad. Too many catches. Okay. Where is that? Okay. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, so there is a pair of remarks here, and uh, I leave it to you. And also, uh, in the end of the slides, you will find two slides, which will give you a couple of homeworks. And the tutor will solve uh, some of them, or perhaps all of them. Some of them must be solved, because those are related with our discussions. Okay. So I start with the definition. Suppose A is a sigma algebra. So I'm sorry, a, a sigma algebra is on a set X. So X is, a, X is a given set and S is a sigma algebra. You simply call that sigma algebra as a measurable space. Okay, so what is measure, measurable space? A measurable space is nothing but a sigma algebra. And you will know the definition of sigma algebra. Simple, so it's just a different name perhaps. The elements of S or the measurable space or the sigma algebra on the set X. So whenever you pick an element from S, you call them, uh, you, call, you call it as a measurable set. So the element of the measurable space of the sigma algebra is known, uh, algebra is known as measurable sets, okay? All right, now second definition. So this is very important. And second definition is, is, the, is called uh, measurable function. So you start with a measurable space. Now, this is what we'll do. We'll just say X is a measurable space. When you say X is a measurable space, immediately you must understand X is attached with a sigma algebra S. Is that clear? So measurable space is a set X, but it comes with a sigma algebra, measurable set. Uh, the set of all measurable subsets, let's say, okay? So you have a measurable space X, and y, a topological space, and then you consider f from x to y. And you call f from x to y, that function, a measurable function, if, if inverse of v is in s, for all v open in, open in y. Open in y. So you, you understand the definition? It's, it goes very close to continuity, right? So whenever you find an open set here, you look at the inverse image of A of that, and you come back here. So that will be a subset of X, and you want that inverse image to be a measurable set. That means if inverse of V, you want to be in S. Is the definition is clear? Right? So just note this, I need a measurable space here, and I need a topological space here. Well, you can actually replace this also by a measurable space. So you can also replace this, you know, so let's say XS is the measurable space in the left and Y, let's say S tilde V, another measurable space. You can do the same thing that also works. That's also another definition, but for us measurable function means this, okay? Partly we'll be mostly interested in real valued uh, case. So Y will be R or complex plane or extended complex plane. I'm sorry, extended real line. So these are our interest. However, nobody stops you to do this as well. Okay, so any doubt, any question? No. All right. <clears throat> so a uh, couple of notes. So these are uh, important and I recommend you to do that. To, do, to solve or supply the details. So suppose you have a function, nothing to do with measurability, etc. You have just a function f from x to y, x, y, just two arbitrary sets, okay? So it's a function and you know that f inverse is a set function. You know that, right? 
So F inverse goes from power set of Y to power set of X, correct? And how you define F inverse of V? So if V is a subset of Y, that means if V is an element of PY, F inverse of V is defined by a subset of X. So it takes you here. So a subset of X, so F inverse is a subset of A. And what is the subset? It is those little x in cap x such that fx is in t. So this is the definition of inverse, what is coming here, right? But I recommend you to consider f inverse as a map from power set to power set, okay? All right. So in a sense, you can say f inverse is a set function. Do you buy this, right? So if inverse is a set function, and sometimes we write, you know, and here also we write, we just write f inverse of x, or oh, sorry, f inverse of y. So you should consider this as an element of p e of x, is it not? If it is inject, uh, injective or etc., invertible, etc., those are different, but otherwise this. So when you write these, the, the meaning of this is nothing but f inverse of, of this set, right? So this is the real meaning. And here is a crucial observation. And this you should do. This is just set theory. If you have not done this, today is the day. Please do it. And it's just simple set theory. It is very interesting. If you see from this point of view, what it says, suppose you have a function f from x to y. Then f inverse, the set function from power set to power set, obeys certain interesting set operations. Obey in the sense, f inverse goes well, f inverse preserves union, intersection, and the difference. This is difference, right? Set difference, right? Yeah. So union, intersection, and difference. And this is all you say, but if you want to write this down mathematically, so this is how it goes. So F inverse of Y minus V will be X minus F inverse of V. That's number one. So V complement is nothing but F inverse V complement like that, right? Sorry, v, F inverse of V complement is F inverse V complement, correct? F inverse of the union will be union of F inverse. F inverse of the intersection will be intersection of F inverse. Very easy. It's just set theory. Please do it, okay? So this is what you have to keep in mind. F inverse goes well with all these three natural operations, right? So this is point three. Now, if you agree with these three, then you have something interesting. It is the following. Now I bring uh, our sigma algebra, et cetera. Suppose f is a function from x to y and s is a sigma algebra on y. So here you have a sigma algebra in the right side, okay? So y has a sigma algebra. So y comes with a sigma algebra. That means y is a measurable space, right? So y is a measurable space. And then with that if you can do the following, you construct SF, S sub F, that means is you are constructing a set depending on F, okay? So S sub S by definition is this collection of F inverse of V where V is in S. So what you are doing, you are pulling back the sigma algebra from here to the left side, correct? And the conclusion is, in that case, uh, this SF will be also a sigma algebra. I said it is homework, it straight away follows from here. And you must do this, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? So in the right side, you have a sigma algebra and you have a function. With respect to that function, you can pull the sigma algebra from right to left, what, we got, what I said as pullback, and you can get a sigma algebra on the left, right? For instance, you can play this game with Borel set. So suppose I define right. Yeah. So suppose you have a you know y is a topological space and you consider the Borel uh, Borel uh, sigma algebra, and then with respect to f, you pull that Borel sigma algebra to the to the left, right? And that will be a sigma algebra on x, and consequently f will be measurable function. Do you understand this step, right? But if will be measurable function, but the sigma algebra on the left will entirely depend on your f. That means if you come up with a different f tilde, you will get a different sigma algebra, 
right? But this is very important. Any question? No. Other way around. So what you did, you did pull back, right? Now you can do push forward also it, as follows. So you have a function from x to y, and now you have sigma algebra on x. So S is a sigma algebra on x. Now that tells you you can push it to y to get another sigma, to get a sigma algebra, which will depend on f as well as s, just the way you did in part three. And how you do that? Very simple. S f is subset of all subsets of y such that f inverse of v is in s. And again, with this equality, it's just a matter of one or two lines. You can prove it is going to be a sigma algebra. But there is a question here. Yes, but. Priyanka? There, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, when you said that uh, we are pulling back, uh, say, sigma algebra from the right to left, will that be also a Borel sigma algebra if we take a Borel sig sigma algebra on the right? Uh, look, look, look. Borel, when you say Borel, when you say Borel, you need a topology. Do you remember that? So X yes, is sir. a topological space, correct? And yes, then sir. you look at tau X, the topology, that set of all open subsets, right? And then you look at sigma of X, that's the Borel one, right? Yes. I, there is nothing to do with Borel, right? When you pull back, correct? Because oh, X, okay. is, X is not even a topological space. And even if it is topological space, there is no guarantee that it is going to be equal to that. Partly it, it depends on your F, correct? Sir? Yes. Uh, if uh, we are given that the function is continuous, uh, then you are going to get, I guess, you are going to get a smaller sigma algebra, smaller than the Borel. Borel said, ah, yes. Sir. Because you see, it's like a weak continuity type of thing, if you know what it is, right? So you're going to get something uh, smaller or large. Yeah, I guess smaller, sir. Smaller, right? Smaller, right? So, no, I mean, no, yeah. If it is continuous, then small. But no, you don't expect that to be, <coughs> you know. See, this is. This is precisely that sigma algebra which makes f to be a measurable function. Correct? To turn, to turn, to realize your function as a measurable, how many uh, measurable subsets you need? That exactly what you get. Nothing more, nothing less. Clear? Any other question? No. Okay. Now, here is a very important uh, observation. By the way, I said I'm following Rudy. Actually, I realized that you can do many places. You can actually quite a bit of improve uh, rather than Rudy. So you can do a little better than Rudy. Maybe it's uh, it's time. It's uh, yeah, it's a bit old book now. Okay, <clears throat> so you will see some of the <clears throat> uh, here and there in these notes. So number five. Uh, suppose x is a measurable space. See, I'll write sometime x comma s to tell you my I have x. Of course, it's a set. It's a measurable space with respect to the sigma algebra s. Sometime I'll not write. You should understand from the context. And y is a topological space, and f is a function. So yeah, I hope you are not confused seeing this, right? So this ordered pair is is known as the measurable space. So now let b y. So it's a topology space and it is a measurable space and uh, it's a function and by is the Borel sigma algebra on y and you know it is nothing but sigma of tau. Then this f is measurable by definition. f is measurable when? f is measurable if by definition f inverse of v is in s for every v in tau y, correct? Correct? That's the definition. So this is it is this is the this is the statement, but instead of by it is tau y. The result says not only tau y, you can have all over by. What is by? By is the Borel sigma algebra on y. Look, this side is trivial. That means if this is true for all by, then it is true also for tau y, and hence it is measurable. So you're actually telling much more. The other direction is little clever, a little bit, not much, okay? So if, suppose for other direction, what you have, if is measurable, so you look at what you want, uh, you want f inverse v to be in s, right? All right, so you collect those v 
subset of y such that f inverse v is in s remember this one push forward all right so that's the set and that's a sigma algebra by part four and this sigma algebra contains tau y because f is you know measurable so it contains all the tau y if it's measurable right and the, so that means tau y is subset of sf if tau y is subset of sf then sigma algebra generated by tau y will be contained in uh, sf and sigma algebra is what it is nothing but v of y that completes the proof right why because by is the smallest sigma tau y which is by is the smallest sigma algebra which contains tau y so you use the minimality and prove that contained in sf and that gives you the proof right so understand this one is done but have a look so keep this in mind it's measurable if and only if f inverse v is in s for every v in by and you are your b uh, by is there in the right on the right side okay so you can say that so this is my point number five and i guess i have six as well but uh, before i go to six it pause for something it's about topology on the extended real line. You recall minus infinity to plus infinity is just the real line R in union with two symbols. The, sim the meaning of the symbols are known uh, is known to us. We know what is the meaning of plus infinity or minus infinity. But treat them as symbol with those natural orderings. Okay, you have natural order. So you have all these infinities bigger than you treat infinity as a symbol, but you also give an order. So it is bigger than any number and so on and so forth. Minus infinity is smaller than any number and so on and so forth. Okay. Mm, so this has all, all a natural ordering. Also recall now this is a little bit crucial to remember that uh, the usual topology on R, which you denote by R sub u, is given by what? Right. This is just set of all intervals open intervals a b and arbitrary union of such open intervals that is tau sub u the usual uh, topology is the arbitrary union of a alpha b alpha over uh, an index set lambda right i said also union empty set but i think uh, doesn't none of the book says because I, then i got confused but i think it's not needed right when you say arbitrary union then you can take this lambda to be empty set is it not if you take lambda to be empty set, then empty set also comes into the picture. So this is not needed, but you should know it's there. You understand? So do you agree that tau u is nothing but uh, arbitrary union of open intervals? That's how it gets generated, right? If you know that, then I'm going to talk about similar topology, but on the extended line. How you do that? Well, first of all, this extended line is, you consider it as this, R union plus minus infinity. Then R part must be there. That means this tau u should be the top part of the topology of this minus infinity to plus infinity. But then the trouble is you have to worry about this plus infinity and minus infinity. Look, how these guys comes by the way, open interval. Open interval comes because they are never root of of any, you know, you take arbitrary point, there is an open interval, which you, consider, which you consider as an open neighborhood, is it not? What you need for extended one, you need a neighborhood of plus infinity, and you need a neighborhood of minus infinity, simple. If you get that, that's that's done. Then take that those neighborhoods, and then take again arbitrary union, and then you get the topology. And that's exactly the point. So for plus infinity, what would be your neighborhood? Well, the open neighborhood will be open A closed infinity. Minus infinity is neighborhood will be minus infinity open A. Because you see, when you look at this, there is nowhere to go beyond minus infinity, right? There is no one to nowhere to go after plus infinity. Those are stopped, right? So these this closed, this part closed, these ends are legitimate. But in the left side for this guy must be open because you want open neighborhood. And this one also, for some reason, you want that to be open. So what would be the topology? It would be the usual one, all these neighborhoods, and unions of first and second kind. In other words, this topology would be arbitrary unions of A, B, open intervals, minus infinity to P, B, 
closed open and open closed q infinity you take whatever union you wish that's it and again i wrote uh, uh, and uh, empty set but as i said so when you say arbitrary union and empty set is not needed so it's gone but you must know it's there okay any question no fine uh, here is a little interesting homework i said it is topology you know r is a topology but r is also matrix space uh, you know the distance comes through the modulus can you think something similar can you say this topology also comes through a metric so it's a question this minus infinity plus infinity is in fact a metric space and my question is why and how think about it okay think about it by yourself now point 6 so that was a pause you know we just talked about uh, topology over minus infinity to plus infinity <laughs> now so once you have a topology on extended line you can talk about borel sigma algebra simple what is borel sigma algebra a sigma algebra generated by generated by what by all the unions of these open sets right clear and we dealt this guy earlier how we dealt well we looked at those you remember the trick uh, i mentioned this so you if you have uh, you know if you have a closed end so let's say a b and you want to write this as a union of because you are going to hit the sigma algebra so how you do that so you write a b is it plus or minus is it right this equality b minus 1 by n is it minus minus yes sir but minus will give you closed no sir it will be plus plus with the intersection for intersection uh, i'm sorry it is intersection right uh, that that was your confusion oops so it's intersection sorry about that. correct so you, you can you can get rid of this closed end by open guy as long as you are in sigma algebra you can say this open closed is also generated by open thing so this is going to be part of the sigma algebra and so on and so forth so you play similar kind of tree and do it and prove that the sigma algebra generated by extended topology is nothing but a infinity open closed or minus infinity open a sorry, closed comma a open for any a in r and so on so just the same way but please do it make sure that you understand this thing and you understand uh, this equality so as i said it is just similar to page six but it's a serious homework you must do it and i think tutor may not do it okay because uh, you should do it by yourself once you have the hold of the by the way why not talking about extended uh, real line it's very important in measure theory it's a bit tricky also to deal with infinity minus infinity plus infinity. it's very slippery uh, i do mistake you many people do mistake okay so you have to be very careful if when you deal with uh, this infinity but one thing you must keep in mind the in the neighborhood of plus minus infinities are of this kind why right? it's, it's like this okay and that would help you to resolve all the things. In any case, after this, in so, once you know this sigma algebra is all of it, this type, and if you remember part five, which says a function f from x to y is uh, y is a topological space is measurable if and only if f inverse b is in s for every v in b y, every v in b y. You keep stress this part hard, okay? B y, okay? So if you agree with that, then you can say, and if you know you're in this case, your b infinity or b sub y is sigma of this or sigma of that or what not, immediately you get help. What it says, so it's a corollary. Suppose f from x to extended line is a function. X is a measurable space. You see, now I am slowly dropping this x comma x. So it's a measurable space with some sigma algebra is then f is measurable if and only if f inverse of a infinity closed is in s 
because of these and because of that result part five right if and only if f inverse of minus infinity comma a is in a s for all a in r because of what because of this and again part five are you convinced so it, it gives you very quickly how you get this equivalence okay any question so this is a very key you know kind of a key result you can quickly check and you can quickly use also uh, for the set of uh, measurable functions and measures measurable sets and so on so the trick is what trick is number 6 kind and five five means one more time this okay so five and six gives you this but for non extended real line that means for uh, you know for, for functions from x to r we also have similar type of thing uh, instead of b infinity we had b and we had similar equality right in that case you cannot have you cannot include plus infinity or minus infinity you can have you know open a comma b or open a close b and so on so forth. remember if you hit that then the similar tree similar use of five and six would give you what would give you this result given a function f from x to r the following are equivalent so when you say r it's the usual metric okay i don't say it but you must assume this r is nothing but with usual and uh, if I say minus infinity root plus infinity, you must assume it is with the usual metric along with those uh, you know extended uh, extended usual metric. Let's say. So the following are equivalent if is measurable if and only if same type. Remember those uh, equality right? So if inverse closed a open infinity, you cannot take closure close of infinity right? So you cannot do that. So this is in man what is saying. So I think this I copied from uh, Rudin, maybe I don't know. So or so this should be S, right? Because S is our or this maybe would have been easier to change this. Maybe I do that because you should be familiar with all the notations. Okay. So uh, so x comma m who this is same. Is it clear to you? Any doubt? Any question? No. Hmm. Going slow. <coughs> All right. So here is a definition of Borel measurable functions. Okay. All right. Suppose x, y. Are topological spaces. So now in this case, your both x and y are topological spaces. Okay. And uh, usually when I say b sub x, it is the Borel sigma algebra of x. B sub y, Borel sigma algebra of y. So a function f from x to y is called Borel measurable. If your x, the sigma algebra on x is b sub x. Right? The definition of measurability required a sigma algebra in, in, in the left side, right? A sigma algebra on X. So you take that sigma algebra to be your BX because it's topological space. You are allowed to talk about that. Once you yeah, take I mean, yeah. Yes. Any question? No, it was not question. Okay, so you replace the sigma algebra. I mean, so you consider the sigma algebra over x as b of x, as the Borel sigma algebra, and in that case, you call that function to be Borel measurable function. Look, in in uh, on the right side, you have no option, you have no choice. It is always b sub y, correct? The Borel sigma algebra is b sub y. On the left, you have option. Either dx or some given sigma algebra. I'm saying if it is dx, call it Borel measure. Simple. Huh? Okay, I think, yeah, home problem. So now you see when I say if inverse v belongs to dx for all v belongs to tau y, it is by definition. That's the defin definition of measure, right? All v belongs to tau y. But already we observed, you know, 0.5 in 
be, you know, interesting point five. Where is that? Right here. I have done this repeatedly. So if you recall that, you can simply replace tau y, but y, but uh, by b of y. So you can say f inverse b belongs to b x for all v belongs to b y, right? So you can take this as a definition, or you can also take this as a definition. Both ways fine. One will imply other. There is a simple fact, a continuous function f from x to y is always more than measurable. Doesn't it follow from the definition? It falls, right? So you take a continuous function from x to y, right? And you take an open set from here, that means from tau y, correct? And now you said, uh, since it is border, f inverse b is going to be in b of x, and b of x is your ambient sigma geography. So it's, 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 it's measurable. So continuity implies Measurability, measure Borel measurability. However, Borel measurability doesn't imply continuity. We'll see some part of examples and so on, but let's not get into that. Converse is not true by far. Now, a note, rather notation. Suppose you have sets. So I in this part, I have nothing to do with topology x. It's just set. Okay. So x to y, y to z. F is a function, G is a function, and A is a subset of Z. A is a subset of Z. Now look at the composition G compose A, take inverse of image of A. And that's going to be equals to F inverse of G inverse of A. Look, again, I'm back to that, uh, you know, that uh, set function inverse. I'm, all I'm saying, the set, uh, the inverse function, the inverse function is compatible with the composition, right? Inverse function is compatible with the composition because you will, f gives you a map, uh, you know, this gives you a map from p of x, sorry, p of x to p of y to p of x, right? So you can go other way around on at the level of power set. And all it says, you look at the composition, it behaves fantastic, okay? It's a really powerful thing, very simple, but powerful thing. So keep this in mind. And again, it's a simple set theory. We use this simple fact to prove something more interesting. Suppose now X is a measurable space, Y, Z, both are topological space, F and G are function. Now, not only, just not just general function, F is measurable, first one is measurable, and second one is Borel measurable. Borel measurable means what? When you talk about Borel measurability, you must have a topological space on the left because that's the sigma algebra you have chosen, right? So don't get confused. So when you say Borel is measurable, this is a topological space. All right, so you do that. Now you ask, am I going to get G compose A, which is going to be from X to Z as a measurable function or not? See, in principle, you, you want to have a measurable function here and measurable function here, so the question of the composition of measurable function is measurable or not? If you ask that, answer is no in general. And there are some examples, uh, Cantor function is uh, required, perhaps there are other way, but we don't have time to talk about all those. But if you want positive detection, you look at this definition, you look at this equality of the composition. If you want G compose F inverse of A to be a measurable set, to make sure that G compose F is a measurable function, all you want G compose, sorry, a G inverse of A to be a, 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 an open set. I'm sorry, uh, you know, an, an element of the Borel set. And that's exactly what happens when you say G is a Borel measurable function. So it just follows from this equality that G compose F inverse U, if U is an open set in Z, is going to be what? F inverse G inverse U, this is open and this is measurable and you are done. Similarly, if you choose this, instead of uh, this uh, to be Borel measurable, if you choose continuous in particular, that is also fine. So keep this in mind. It's also easy to see that composition of measurable continuous perfect. Otherwise it's not free, okay? Any question? No. Uh, I, but as I said, 
you should also keep in mind, um, I don't have time. I mean, it's six lecture, we just can't do all this. Uh, you also know that uh, the composition of uh, measurable function uh, is not necessarily measurable. Okay. Now, here is, a, um, here is a slightly different way to look at uh, the idea of rooting. So, uh, I'm not in measure yet. So, this is a basic thing. So, look at R to U. You know what is R to U, right? So, what is R to U? Can you tell me what is R to U? What do you, what do you understand by R to U? What? Tell me. Some of you. One of you. Product topology, R cross uh, R? So, usual topology in R2. Uh, what is that? What is the usual topology of R of you? Product topology induced by R. By? By the metric topology by. in R. Uh, but we just explained, right? R U means what? Arbitrary union of open intervals, right? Mm -hmm. So you can say that also comes from the, uh, the metric, as you are what I was trying to say. Here also you can say that same, but here, what would be the basic open set? It would be just rectangle, right? Correct? So it will be like A1, B1, cross A2, B2. Is it not? So you take all this class and you take arbitrary union of this. of boxes, open boxes, right? I'm writing boxes because, uh, you know, uh, this works in RN also. Do you understand this? You know this, right? Clear? Of course, you can talk about ball or you can talk about disk, but disk contains a box, right? right? You understand this, right? I mean, so if you, if you, can, if you consider a point, if you consider a point, you say it's a neighbor, uh, you know, you, you get a disk here and you say this is an open neighbor, correct? But don't forget, inside disk also you can fit a box. And similarly, inside a box also you can see fit a, a disk and so on. So all these things works, but it's slightly easier to see that uh, boxes forms the basic open set. That means you take arbitrary union and that gives you the set of all open sets, right? Okay, so now I come to our business. So define pi one from R to U to R U by pi one x y equals to x. So this is very familiar. This is called projection, right? So this is true for all x y in R two. Of course, when you write R sub U, this the you you don't stress anymore the x variable, but it should be clear from the context. Okay, so if this is the definition, now you tell me what is pi one inverse y naught. Don't forget when I say pi one inverse y naught, it, I mean the set, correct? So y naught singleton set, that's inverse map I'm talking about. That's inverse image I'm talking about, correct? So pi one inverse y naught is what? Do you agree with this? It is all r times y naught. Do you agree? Y naught cross r. Oh, is it? Why not? No. Actually, oh, I see. Uh, oh, oh, that's that's awful. Look what I did. I made a mistake. So <laughs> it should be. What is why not? Why not? You are right. What do you said? Why not cross R? Right? Yes, sir. Why not cross R? Yes, because it's projection onto the first coordinate, right? So yes. Thank you very much. Do you agree, all of you? Correct. Because of why not, I messed up. Okay. <laughs> uh, it should be x naught, is it not? It should be x naught. That is the reason I messed up. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Now, all these things should be corrected. So, this is x cross r. Uh, maybe we'll see. So, do you agree that pi, in, pi 1 inverse y naught equals to y naught times r? Correct? Because, you know, Projection doesn't care the second guy, 
it's all about the first one, first one. So if this is the case, then pi one inverse a for any a subset of R will be what? Will be a times R, correct? Right? Because what you'll do, you'll just take the union, and the union will just give you a back here, correct? If that is the case, then you can say in particular, if your u is open subset, then pi one inverse u will be what? u times r, correct? Correct? So this will be what? u times r, correct? If this is u times r, and if u is open, if r is, and we know r is open, then u times r is open, right? So inverse image of this open set is going to be open in R2, right? And that tells you pi one is a quantity mass function. Yeah, I think you know this, but I'm just explaining a little slowly. Clear? Similarly, the second projection, pi two, which I think I have not written down the definition, but I hope it is clear to you. So this is the first projection and this is the second projection. That means projection onto the, uh, onto the y, uh, with respect to the y, coordinator, whatever we say. Uh, this is also continuous. So altogether, you get the projection maps from R2 to R are uh, continuous functions. Of course, this has nothing to do with you know R2 or R. You can talk about x1 times x2 or even n product. You can take x1 up to xn, that product, and you can talk about projection on any one of these xi's in the topological sense. Similar thing will work. Okay, but it's our interest is in this case, so I'm just explaining. So any question on this? No? If not, then with this in mind, I have a setting. I do some setting, okay? Then I come to the point. Setting is the following. Suppose I have a function capital A from X to R2. And if you have a function like that, you can write Fx, Will be, you know, it will have x component and it will have y component. And I call the x component as f1x, the first component as f1x, and the second component as f2x. Can I do that? Right? So if it is two variable, you know, it goes to R2, then there will be coordinate, and the first one is f1x and the second one is f2x. Subsequently, capital F would give you two functions, f and f1 and f2 from x to R. Right, and here is the point. You can rewrite or you can uh, recover your function through this formula. F1 is nothing but pi one, F2 is nothing but pi two. Do you see that? Right, that's how it is. So F1 is F1 is what? F1 is nothing but the first projection. F2 is the second projection. That's what I'm saying. Simple. Okay, once you have these, then your life becomes slightly simpler, and that's why I so in many parts you see we are differing from Rudy place to place. This is also one option, one location. So, fact one okay, now I say now I assume that x is a measurable space. So far, I have not assumed anything, okay, but now I'm assuming x is a measurable space. Okay, so suppose X is a measurable space. And uh, so in this picture, now X is a measurable space. Fact one, if F capital big F is measurable, then the little f, F1, F2 are also measurable. How the proof goes? Just this. See, we already know that pi one and pi two, they are continuous function, right? So your F1 is what? Capital F is measurable by assumption. Pi one is continuous uh, as a fact. So this is continuous composition with measurable is going to be measurable, right? What we are using? We are using this fact. Maybe this one. Measurable continuous measurable, right? So is, is it right? Uh, G composite. 
What is this? Who is calling you us? This guy is calling you us, right? And that's the case here. Okay. So this follows from that simple observation. So what you are saying, big F is measurable would imply little f1 and f2 are also measurable. And the converse is also, also true. That means that's part two. F1, F2 is measurable would imply big F is also measurable. And this is also very simple. How you do that? Well, you have to prove that F inverse, big F inverse of A is measurable for every Borel set A, correct? In R2. So if A is a subset of R2 and A is a Borel set, you want to prove F inverse A is also Borel set. That's your goal, don't forget that. And how you do that? It's a very simple observation. And this is this part has been pointed out by Rudy, this one at least, surely. That big F inverse Y1, Y2 is, so it's a set function, don't forget, is nothing but little F1 inverse Y1, intersection little f2 inverse y2. I have done this. As I said, it's very simple. Can we check this? Make sure this we are saying right. So this is homework. Just set theory again. Nothing serious. So on C of this, then you can say f inverse of a is also going to be f1 inverse of a intersection f2 inverse of a. Now look at your assumption. If your f1 f2 measurable and a is a is a uh, is a borel set or an open set, right? Then f1 inverse a will be measurable, f2 inverse a will be measurable, then the intersection is going to be also measurable, and hence f inverse a is going to be measurable. And that would imply that big F is a measurable function, right? So what you prove, you prove the following. So in this picture, f from x to r2, this cap big F is measurable if and only the coordinates are measurable. Okay. Okay. Oh, I have written this down. So theorem: uh, Let big F is f1, f2 from x to r2. Then big F is measurable if and only small f1, f2 are measurable. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now this part is slightly different. I'm I'm saying this because in the uh, after uh, you know end of the slide, I'll just give you some part from Rudy. Okay. So you should not feel uncomfortable there. That's the reason I'm mentioning this. So in particular, here is the particular case. If x to r2, oops, what is this two by the way? This should be u, okay? This should be u. Usual. So if x to r2 u uh, is, is it's a measurable space, this is usual, and then you go to another topological space y, I think this is the setting of Rudy. And if you know phi is continuous, and if you know f1, f2 are measurable, I think this is the setting of it. That would, be, so this is, these are measurable, and we just pointed out this is so if and only big F is measurable, then this composition is measurable. I think that's what he proved. Okay, and it follows from here straight away. And here is our point. Now, recall, your R to U is homeomorphic with C U. C is the complex then. And U is the, U refers to the usual metric. Okay. So phi is a map from R to U to C U, where phi xy equals to x plus i y. So this is a homeomorphism. Do you understand that? It is actually you consider R to U as a metric space, you consider C U as a metric space. Uh, the metric in R, on R to U, you consider the usual metric and C U metric is modulus, right? These two are same, correct? The usual metric on R to U, your distance, uh, you know, norm or whatever, I don't know how to say. So the, uh, the norm, the distance from origin is what? Square root of x squared plus y squared in the left, right? Uh, on the right, what you what would be your uh, le length of uh, x plus i y, the modulus is the same thing, square root of x squared plus y squared, right? So it's a it's a metric preserving map and it's a one to it's a one to one and on to its bijection. So it's a homeomorphism, metric homeomorphism and on to. So it's just the same. These two sets are same topologically as well, right? So you already know that R2U is just same as CU as far as 
of this homeomorphism, etc. Not differentiability. We're not going to talk about differentiability. So that's those are different stories. That is different. But if you have this, and if you use this picture, then I re request you to use look at Rudin to prove that simple thing. Suppose X is a measurable space, and U V instead of little f1 f2, you say U V from X to R B functions. And you construct a complex function f equals to u plus i q. U is the real is the real part and v is the imaginary part of the function f. And then you can prove part one is straight right here, straight away follow that f is complex measurable. Well, you have to introduce the, in this picture. You have to introduce you have to replace y by c sub u, and this phi. Is the homeomorphism. So if you do that, you straight away get part one. So if it's complex measurable, if and only the real part and imaginary part are measurable, real measurable. That's number one. Number two, a little bit of play, which you can look at Rudin and you can immediately get hint, would tell you if f and g are complex measurable functions, then f plus g, f dot g are also complex measurable functions, as well as modulus of f is a real measurable function. And this part, I think I have given a proof. I don't remember whether uh, the hint, actually, I have given some hint. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute um, whether that helps you to, that gives you a different proof. I don't remember. Okay, I don't remember. I will not comment on that. It's not hard anyway. So you can use the, this to prove that mod f is a real measurable function. But one thing here I want to point out. When you say it's a function from where to f, x to c, there is another category. So when you say x to c, there is nothing called, you know, well, a priori or as of now. There is, okay, there is another thing to talk about. Let me tell you that first. So there is another thing to talk about. Functions from x to extended real life, right? You actually don't consider over here. That's a different story. You don't have anything like infinity, plus infinity, minus infinity over here in this picture. Okay. So this thing goes quite smoothly. But if you ask the similar question for this case, you can ask the same question, for instance, part two, not part one. For part two, you can ask the same question, right? So if you ask the same question for part two, it becomes slightly delicate. And while you do the homework, you'll figure out essentially similar way you can prove the same type of results okay so i leave i leave that to you but just a reminder that real value versus c value there is a difference when you talk about real value you essentially include plus minus infinity and you know why you include plus minus infinity it goes to my first lecture i told you that the living integration also want to take care of unbounded functions, right? Correct? So if you want to take care of unbounded function, your function should assume, I mean, presumably assume plus infinity minus infinity. So this is the customer you have to follow. All, all in all, if you are in this setting, measurable functions forms an algebra, fantastic. Because some goes, product goes, and also it is closed under, you know, uh, absolute value and so on and so forth. So this completes more or less today's lecture. And as I said, here, here are some, some questions. And I have consulted Rudin as usual. And also there is a book by G.B. Foland. You can have a look. I think that's a very good book. But in this series of lectures, even after my six lectures, uh, I think we agreed to follow Rudin. So better not to deviate a lot. Okay. Lots of books, so it's very easy to get confused. Don't do that. Maybe I read out one or two problems. As I said, the tutor will do it uh, maybe tomorrow, since tomorrow is, is pending. So you can have, uh, you, can, you, sh you should try. You should try by yourself. You should have your own solution and then check. For instance, this one is something I like to explain. Suppose you have a function f from xs to extended real line. And then the result you want to prove is the following. Then this f is measurable 
you understand that you are in a different situation your sigma you know borel sigma algebra is slightly different right it's not line it's extended one right so this is measurable if and only i said either f inverse infinity or f inverse of minus infinity one of them and f inverse of ab are in s for all a less than b look f inverse of ab is in s that's the case if you take the real line if you drop plus minus infinity you agree that's the definition of measurability right so if inverse of ab is in s that's essentially comes from the real line now you ask the plus minus infinity neighborhood part you say if i can assure one of these either if inverse infinity or if inverse of minus infinity is measurable i'm done then i can say this extended one extended valued function measurable yes uh, any question no it seems uh there is a little confusion i think tutor also can i have given hint i mean given not only hint also perhaps the proof uh but in the textbook full and for instance i think full and say both of them he seems to say not or he seems to say and but i think it's or so just make sure when you do this proof uh, make sure uh i'm right otherwise we go back to full and so my point is the following minus infinity suppose uh, i think i for this hint you will use this part okay so minus infinity is nothing but the complement of plus infinity in products oh oh so talk is stupid is the complement of it is this complement oops i think that's what you need that if you know this this will follow or if you know this this will follow all i mean this will imply this and this will imply this if you know if inverse ab is also in this so this you want to check let me know if it doesn't work because as i said i have given hint and sort of solution as well but maybe i'm wrong but uh, i think this is comes from foland and he said both okay and uh, number 3 is a very interesting one it says that if you have a pair of functions again extended real line so this part should you know should be you should be taken care very carefully you have to be very careful when you say minus infinity or plus infinity okay so prove so if you have given a pair of functions measurable functions you have to prove that the place where f is larger than g is going to be measurable it's very interesting set those x for which f is larger than g is going to be measurable and this is part 1 and once you do part 1 you have a very good reward in part 2 once you have part 2 then you go to part 4 which is very easy uh i guess i guess you need uh, I, i guess you need that so suppose f and g are from my maybe not f and g are measurable function but again extended real line prove that max fg and min fg are also measurable you know the definition of max fg and min fg you know that right do you know or not i remind you quickly so max fg at the point x so this is a function okay this is a function this is nothing but simple as you know maximum of fx gx similarly mean and you want to do that how you prove a function is measurable you prove a function is measurable by proving that the inverse image of you know a closed infinity open is measurable but in this case since you are in the extended line you have to look at what you have to look at a closed open doesn't matter but infinity is closed that should matter so you should prove 
that the function inverse of the following set, which set A open or closed, doesn't matter. A open, closed, whatever it is. Let's say A open, but infinity closed. That inverse image is measurable. Or minus infinity closed, A open, that set, that inverse image is measurable. This is what you want to prove. Do it and do it by yourself. That, that would be really fun. Don't look at book or internet or whatever. I mean, nowadays it's very difficult. Every problem you write, there is solution somewhere. So don't do that, okay? Because then you know you won't learn otherwise. And here I said this officially. If oh, right here. But here I said it's R. Why did I say it R? I said it R, but additional homework. Can you replace five A? I I think it's R is not needed. Replace R by minus infinity to plus infinity. This will do also. So first you do for R, then because I have done this for minus infinity to plus infinity. So there is no reason for this not to work. Okay. So do this. And uh, so that would give you that modulus of F is measurable as well. Uh, and here is a question on sigma algebra. Prove that two, the union of two sigma algebra is not necessarily sigma algebra. And then you just want to try with finite set. And the final one is a bit interesting. Uh, it's about, again, sigma algebra. Uh, please try to do that. It's easy. And that's all I, I want to say today. Thanks. If you have any question, I'm done. Any question?